Let's go, can we, to Judges chapter 13. We are tonight going to look at Samson. Uh, he is one that we just finished a detailed study on. But if you're doing a survey of the book of Judges, you really can't skip over chapter 13 through 16 because it's pretty key uh, to what is going on. One of the things about the story of Samson that I don't know that I mentioned when we were looking at his biography a few weeks ago, he's the last judge of the book that's mentioned as a judge. Uh, so his is the last, you know, we talked about all of these cycles uh, in the book, these cycles of Israel's sin, and then they're, they're taken into captivity as chastisement from God, and then they get tired of that, so they cry out to God, and then God delivers them. And that cycle occurs again and again and again until you come to Samson, and he is the last cycle of that sin, captivity, repentance, and deliverance that you find here in the book. We've been out of Judges for, uh, for a little bit, so let's just, re let's just rehash what we've covered so far. Certainly, we haven't looked at every uh, chapter and every personality in the book, but we've covered a few of them. We started with an intro to the book, and then in chapter 3, we met this man named Othniel, and he delivered, uh, he delivered Israel from Mesopotamia. He judged Israel for eight years, the Bible says, and after he died, they had rest, the Bible says, in Israel for 40 years. He judged them for eight, and then they had rest for 40 years. Next, we looked at Ehud, and that's, uh, you remember that story, Ehud and Eglon and uh, that's just a, a descriptive story of an assassination. And here's Ehud, chapter 3 and verse 12. He delivered Israel from Moab. He judged Israel for, uh, he judged Israel for 18 years, Scripture says. And once he died, they had rest after Ehud for 80 years. The next judge we looked at was Deborah. And she uh, delivered them from the Canaanites. She judged Israel 20 years they had rest for 40. And then there was Gideon. And that's a fantastic story. God gives a lot of, he gives a lot of press time to uh, Gideon in the Bible and, and the, the miraculous deliverance there from the Midianites. An unarmed army delivered, uh, 300 men delivered Israel. And the Bible says he judged them for seven years and they had rest. Israel had rest for 40 years after that. Last time we looked at Jephthah, a man of character, and he delivered Israel from Ammon, and he judged Israel for 18 years. And the Bible doesn't say how long Israel had rest after Jephthah. And Samson judged Israel for 40 years, delivered them from the Philistines, and the Bible doesn't say how long the land had rest after that either. Samson's the last judge by name in the book. We'll look at him tonight. Um, he begins his judging ministry 20 years into the 40-year Philistine captivity. The Philistines have been oppressing them for 20 years. Samson comes on the scene. He delivers them, and then he has a 20-year uh, ministry, and he delivers, uh, he delivers them from the Philistines. The Philistines really caused, and you know that story, they were always causing Israel problems, weren't they? Um, they were the longest oppressors of Israel at 40 years. Um, so we're going to look at Samson tonight in just a survey. I'm, I'm calling this the weakest strong man in history. And just by the title, had you not looked at a scripture reference or heard the name, you would know exactly who we're talking about. Uh, he's the weakest strong man. I put a brief outline of his life um, that since we're surveying it, here's what it would look like. In chapter 13, verses 1 through 25, you have the mission of Samson described. His mission. This is where you meet his parents, what God says he's going to do with them, the instruction for what his mother is to do while she's pregnant, and then the expectation of Samson after he's born. That's his mission. Then it talks about his marriage in chapter 14, just the first four verses. He meets that, uh, he meets that woman. I have, I have seen a woman, he said, down in Timnath. And uh, that's his marriage. In chapter 14, beginning at verse 5, and then all the way through the beginning of chapter 16, you have his mighty deeds and all those fantastic stories about uh, what he did, slaying Philistines uh, for this reason or that reason, picking up the jawbone of the ass, 
burning down cornfields, catching 300 foxes, just all kinds of things, crazy things this guy is doing for chapters 14, 15, and the beginning of 16. And then in the beginning of chapter 16, uh, you, you meet his mistress. There's an unnamed harlot that he meets. It's the mistress. And then you have his misery in chapter 16, verses 20 through 22. And he falls, into, he falls into problems with Delilah and gets captured. And then finally, the martyrdom in verses 23 through 31. That's pretty much the outline of his life from beginning to end. Here's one of the, here's one of the few. It might, in fact, it might be the only judge that we have the beginning of his life and the end of his life. The rest of them just kind of appear on the scene uh, when, they're already, when they're already adults. It says in chapter 10 and verse number 7... Um, well, let's just flip back there. We're going we're gonna to start in Judges 13 in a, moment, in a moment. But in chapter 10 and verse 7, it says, And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. Now, what that means is that Samson and Jephthah were, at least for a period of time, both actively judging the nation of Israel simultaneously. Uh, Jephthah was the one who delivered them from the Ammonites, and Samson is the one who delivered them from the Philistines. So you see that he's contemporary with the judge we talked about two weeks ago, Jephthah, um, and they've been there for a while. Uh, the Philistines began, the Philistines, Bible historians believe they came into the coast by way of the Mediterranean Sea, they came to the southwestern coast of Israel, and that's where they set up their camp. And then they began moving in, and they established cities, five of them, capital cities, um, two of which, by the way, are still in existence today, at least two of them, Ekron and um, Gaza. Those are Philistine. Those are originally Philistine cities, and they began taking over the country. And by the time Samson comes along into the, uh, into the picture, the Philistines have had 100 years or so, somewhere between 95 and 100 years, to establish themselves into the land. All those others, the Ammonites, uh, the Midianites, the Canaanites, all those others that came into the land, they had very temporary goals. They would just come in, they would, uh, they would raid at harvest time. They didn't have any long-term plans, but the Philistines weren't like that. The Philistines came into the land to take it. They came there to establish themselves. Ammon wasn't seeking to expand their borders. Midian wasn't seeking to expand their borders, but the Philistines were. They were an advancing army, and they were a, a consuming army, and they came into the land of Israel, southwestern part. They came there pretty much to stay. They were, uh, they were warriors. They were good at it. And then Samson comes onto the scene, and he's going to, uh, he's going to confront them in a well, I mean, we just went through this. I feel like I'm repeating a lot of what we talked about before. But he, he confronts them in just a very violent way. Every time you turn around, Samson is slaughtering people. Don't, don't romanticize chapters 13 through 16. These are bloody chapters, violent chapters, at the direction of a God who's had enough of the Philistines. Yes, he's delivering his people, but he does it, he does it in his perfect time. Do you remember this phrase in the Old Testament, that the cup of iniquity was not yet full? Remember that phrase? What that's telling, what that's describing for you and me is there is a time when God's grace and God's long-suffering runs out on a people. So when the Bible says the cup of iniquity was not yet full, that means that God hasn't come to his boiling over point. But under Samson, he did. He not only delivered Israel, but he judged the Philistines, and he did both of those things with this man named Samson. His life is just this, this fascinating story, and he just keeps going and, and going. Someone said there's never been such a physically strong man in history like Samson, yet at the same time, one would have to look hard to find someone as spiritually weak in the Bible. I think that's a pretty accurate statement. Physically, it's indescribable what he could do. 
spiritually, he was, he was anemic. What a, what a contrast in him. So I, and, and if I didn't say it, I, I think I did, but if I didn't say it while we studied uh, Samson's life, I think we'll see Samson in heaven one day. I, I think he's a Jehovah worshiper. I, I do. I just, it's the same with Lot. I just think they're just as carnal and worldly as the day is long in the story of, the, of their life here. But I'd like to look tonight at, uh, at this life. I mean, this guy is, you know him, he's one bad decision after another. You know anybody like that in your life? I, I mean, there are certain people that you can relate to in the scriptures, and there are certain people I know, they just make one bad decision after another, and it's like they can't stop. Is that not what you see in Samson? Don't you see that in him? Just every decision he makes seems to be adding to his misery and adding to his problems. Well, I want to look at him tonight and look at, at, at four, uh, I think there are four of them here, lessons to learn, really the value of some things that we get from Samson's life. So let's start in chapter 13, um, which is where we started when he, we did his biography earlier. But let's just read a um, let's start reading there at verse number two. And we won't read the whole chapter. We're just going to allude to some things because I'm hoping after our study you're pretty familiar with these. It says in verse two of chapter 13, there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but... Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no, no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst said, come again to us and teach us what shall we do Unto the child that shall be born, and God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. We won't read the rest of all this. You know this story. But I, I want to first talk about the value of godly parents. The value of godly parents. We'll go through this kind of briefly. It's not going to be a lot of details. We're surveying the book, and we just finished Samson. But can I point out four characteristics that mark this mom and dad and encourage you as mom and dad or as grandma and grandpa? Or if you're an aunt and an uncle, I know Sheila and Jeff have had a lot of influence with, with nieces. Whatever situation God puts you in to have an impact on the younger generation, I'd mark these four things about Manoah and his wife. I know their son didn't turn out uh, maybe as, as they had hoped he would, but mom and dad were godly. They were a godly set of parents. I, I'd like you to notice some things about them. First, note that they were praying parents. They were praying parents. There's nothing greater you can do for your kids than to entreat God on their behalf. Just pray for your kids. That, te that tells us, uh, that lets us know that about them in verse number eight. They were also obedient parents. Look at verse number 12. They ask God, would you send that man back and tell him uh, so he can tell us what we ought to do? Look in verse 12. And Manoah said, now let thy word, my words come to pass. How shall we order the child? How shall we do unto him? They were obedient parents. They, they followed the instructions. They were also worshiping parents. They worshiped the Lord. Your your, parent, your children, your grandchildren, they ought to know that you worship the Lord. I'm not saying that you go to church. I'm saying they ought to know that you worship God. Those are two different things. If your only worship takes place here in this church, you're a sorry Christian. I'm a sorry Christian 
if that only takes place when I'm at church. Worship is an, it is an attitude. It's a life. And here, here this couple is. Look in verses 19 and 20. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon the rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. There's a lot of speculation on what that means. But he, I, we would say this, he put on quite a show. I don't know what that was, but he did wondrously, the Bible says. And Manoah and his wife looked on, for it came to pass when the flame went upward toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended up in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. They were not only praying and obedient parents, they were worshiping parents. And in verse number 22, they were humble parents. It says in verse number 22, Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. They were humble people. I, I would encourage, and, and we don't have a whole lot of young parents going on in here tonight, um, but one of the things that distresses me is the lack of teachability in young parents today with such a great dependence on what they read in books or on the internet compared to counsel that they get from their parents or grandparents. There, there's a lack of humility in them. I don't know, I, you know, I don't know how they did it. Um, I, you know, we kid about it, but from the time we had kids, I was on the phone to my dad and mom, or I was beating a line to David Cross's office, my pastor at the time, and saying, what in the world do I do with this little girl? He had girls, I had girls, it was great. My dad raised five girls, you know. Uh, they're, this, this, and I know they weren't perfect parents here. I know Manoah and his wife were not perfect. But if you'll read the scripture, especially in chapter 13, they set themselves on a good course. Praying parents, obedient parents, worshiping parents, humble parents. Parents. Now, if I was teaching a teen class tonight, I would be talking to those teenagers and telling them, your parents are going to prove to be some of the most, if not the most, valuable assets you have while you grow up. Listen to them. Listen to them. They're seeking the Lord on your behalf. But I'm not teaching teenagers tonight. In fact, I'm teaching a lot of gray-headed people who have raised your kids and you might have some influence on your grandchildren. And so I would say this to you this evening, and I'm saying it to myself as well. Let these four characteristics mark you. Be one who prays for your children and grandchildren. Not with them, for them. It's good to pray with them. But there are some things you might need to say to God about them out of their earshot. Pray for them. The second thing, be obedient to God. Let them see obedience in you. Let them see you sticking to the word of God. Not being hard-nosed. I'm not talking about being a hard-nosed law cracker. I'm, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about let them see you committed to living your life as defined in Scripture. You're not going to beat anybody over the head with the word of God and win them to Jesus. You're just not going to do it. But if they can see Christ in you, if they can see an obedience to the Father like Jesus demonstrated, he thought it, he, he didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. And yet, he humbled himself and he obeyed the Father. Let them see us as praying parents and grandparents, obedient parents and grandparents, worshiping parents and grandparents. I, I have conscientiously tried that when I get into discussion on any given topic with my kids, especially if it's a debatable topic in the world, I have intentionally tried to bring it back to a scriptural reasoning. Do that. Incorporate the word of God. Don't try to reason with kids based on worldly philosophy, on carnal logic. Let them know that if they're going to oppose this, if they're going to, uh, if they're going to question this, let them know that they are opposing or questioning the word of God, not your opinion. My opinion doesn't matter all that much. What is God? I'm going to go away one day. But what is God's word that's never going to go away? What does it say about that topic? 
be worshiping, be humble, all of those things. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8, again, if I were talking to teenagers, I'd go to Proverbs 1.8. And Proverbs 1.8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. But I'm not talking to teenagers. I'm talking to parents and grandparents. And so to you, I would say, be the father and the mother who has, who has the, the right to give instruction, the right to explain the law of God. We have assigned various benchmark ages in our American society. Uh, at 16, you can, you can drive and you can buy tobacco products. Or is it 18? 18 for tobacco, isn't it? 18, you can serve in the military and you can vote. 21, you can go buy alcohol. We've assigned these, these benchmark ages, but here's the truth. There is absolutely no guarantee that wisdom comes with age. I know some 40-year-olds that are dumber than logs, and I, there are 20-year-olds I'd trust before I'd trust that 40-year-old. There is no guarantee that wisdom comes with age. We need to be those people that take the word of God, and we have the backing, we have the we have the, uh, the right to point people into the position. We can say, not, by, not because of what we heard in a book, but because of what we've experienced, that it is worth it to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. We ought to be able to say to our kids and to our grandkids, taste and see that the Lord is good. I've tasted. You taste it too. So, when, so, so be, the, be the father, men. Be the father or grandfather who can give instruction with some credibility. But if they don't see Christ in you, if they don't see Christ in me, that's really not going to matter all that much what we say about God's word. So there's the value of godly parents, first of all, in Samson's life. He had a good shot at it. The second lesson that we learned from him, not only the value of godly parents, I'd like you to see the value of godly peers. Godly peers. P-E-E-R-S, not P-I-E-R-S. I should clarify that, shouldn't I? Samson had a, he had a very hard heart in certain things. Let me just remind you of this. Number one, he was unwilling to listen to his parents regarding his friends. He was unwilling to listen to his parents regarding his friends. Chapter 14, verse number 1 Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. The Holy Spirit's quick to mark that. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. He was unwilling to listen to his parents regarding his friends. Moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, and if you're raising your kids, even if they get upset with you, counsel your kids on who they're hanging around. Let them know that. When you see danger, they may not. Give them good counsel. You recognize character traits in their friends far quicker than they will. And sometimes they'll have a hard time accepting that. They'll say things like this, Oh, you don't know them like I know them. When in truth, you see, what's, you see the person they are probably better than they do. You've got God-given discernment. Counsel your children and set restrictions when it comes to the friends they can hang around. Some, you know, some crazy guy wants to hang around my daughter. That's just not going to happen. It, it, it isn't going to happen. I'll, I'll, I won't tell you the whole story, but there was a guy that he was persistently going after one of my daughters. He was a fellow college student. And I got him on the phone, and I said, so she doesn't want to talk to you or hear from you anymore. And, um, and I said, so don't call her, don't text her, you know, just don't sit with her at chapel, just don't do it. 
And we hung up, and he said, okay, we hung up. And about 15 minutes later, I get a text from my, my daughter and say, he's texting me and call, trying to call me again. So I called him back. And I said, I don't, I don't know what I was unclear about. But I said, I'm about nine hours from Pensacola, Florida, so you can go to bed tonight, and I can be there when you wake up, and we can have breakfast and talk about this. Protect your children. This world is out to destroy them. It, you get that? It's, it's out to destroy your children, your sons and daughters. Satan would love nothing better than to devour them. And that word means exactly what it sounds like, what a lion would do to a gazelle, exactly what it would sound like. Protect them. You say, well, they're going to resent that. doesn't matter. Do you know that your, your relationships with peers, do you know that's, and even for adults, it's a matter of life and death. The scripture says this in Proverbs chapter 13 in verse 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. Listen, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Your kid doesn't have to be a fool to be destroyed. But if they hang around fools, they can be destroyed. It's not that your kid has to be a bad kid. But if he or she is allowed to hang around people who have evil hearts, who don't know the Lord, and they're developing strong relationships and friendships with people who are unsaved, you are putting your child's life at risk. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. The value of godly peers. First, he was unwilling to listen to his parents regarding his friends. Second, I want you to see on this, the value of godly peers I want you to see he was unwilling to learn from his past mistakes. That's in the first verse of chapter 16. He consistently chose the wrong type of women to hang around. It says in chapter 16, verse 1, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. His first wife was a Philistine. And that first wife, her, her family ended up being hostile toward Samson and toward his family. And now he goes to this, now he goes to this, uh, this woman in Gaza, probably another Philistine, but at the very least, she's a prostitute. He doesn't learn from his past mistakes. He picked the wrong woman back in chapter 14, and now he's doing the same thing again. Eventually, his, eventually his father-in-law took that, that woman in chapter 14, remember that? He took Samson's first wife and gave her to another man. It's an, absolute, it's an absolute fact that he does not learn from his past mistakes. He just keeps repeating them again and again. If we learn from our past mistakes, we would save ourselves a lot of heartache. Samson could have saved himself some trouble. If he'd have learned in chapter 14, you wouldn't have the mess of chapter number 16. Now he's chasing this woman in Gaza, and he ends up with even more grief from the Philistines. He was not willing to listen to his parents. He was unwilling to learn from his past mistakes. He was unwilling to love God more than anyone. He was unwilling to love God more than anyone. When you start in chapter 4 and read down 4 or 5, and, or, or chapter 16 rather, verses 4, 5, and 6, you start reading about his relationship with Delilah. He met this woman, and, and I pointed this out the first time. He loved a woman in verse number four. He loved a woman in the valley of Sorek. Sorek, by the way, is not very far from Timnath, where his first wife was. Do you remember what happened to his first wife and her family? The Philistines burned them to death. They burned them to death because of their relationship with, with Samson. Sorek, where Delilah lives, is not very far from, uh, from Timnath. They're all, just, uh, they're all just almost straight across from west of Jerusalem. I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if she had heard about what went on there, but Delilah ends up taking 
she ends up taking Samson completely out of the will of God. God had demanded of, of Samson that his source of strength be kept secret. And he'd seen God great do things uh, uh, through him. And yet, she starts pestering him early in their relationship, apparently, for the secret of his strength. And he holds off as long as he can. But the truth is, and you, can, you see this here, his relationship with, with Delilah was more important than his relationship with God, and he ended up giving her the secret of his strength. There should be absolutely no relationship more important to you or to me than our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That has to be primary in our life. If it is, everything will go fine. If it's not, everything's going to be in a train wreck. Listen to what the Bible says. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 19, this is part of Paul's prayer, one of his two prayers for the Ephesian church. And he says, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. If there's any relationship more important to you than what you have with Jesus, the victorious Christian life is going to be out of reach for you or me. Samson loved Delilah more than he loved God. And his life ends up in a, a, a train wreck. He's, he teaches us anyway. He didn't learn these lessons very well. But he teaches us the lesson of the value of godly parents and the value of godly peers. And I know that you're not teenagers in here. You're far removed from it, some of you. But our peers all through life, our choice of friends, where we choose to take our relationship, that matters. Be careful. Choose wisely. The value of godly parents, the value of godly peers. Look next at the value of godly power. You and I, and this is the Wednesday night crowd who knows his story, you and I both know Samson's strength did not come to himself. And this is my personal opinion. This is just, this is my opinion on this, all right? I don't think Samson looked like most, most pitchers depict him. Most of them picture him like Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was in his prime. He walks around, he's bulging, and he's got muscles on top of his muscles. Uh, he just looks like he ought to be able to pick up city gates. He looks like he ought to be able to kill 300 Philistines at a time. I don't think it looked like that at all. You know why? Because nobody knew where Samson's source of strength was. If I saw Arnold Schwarzenegger, 1975 Arnold Schwarzenegger, not today, but if I saw 75 Schwarzenegger walk through that back door, I would have no question as to why he could do what he could do physically. Look at him. He's huge. But Delilah again and again and again. Samson, what, what's the source of your strength? You know what I think? This is my per Again, my personal opinion. I think he looked like you and me. I, I think he just looked like a normal dude. They had no idea why he was able to do what he did. If he looked like the world's strongest man, there would be no need for her to question that. But they could not figure out, except his parents, no one could figure out why he was so strong. I think he looked like a normal Israelite of his day, just an average fella. And yet the Bible says in chapter 14 that he ripped a lion apart with his hands. Did you all see that? There was a video clip came out a couple years ago of that jogger on a trail out in California, and he had his phone going, and a cougar was stalking him. I don't know if you saw that or not, but that thing comes out on the trail. Those aren't, those aren't like African lion size, but they're still, I don't want anything to do with them. And that, boy, that cat's ears, was they were laid back straight, and it just kept jumping at them. When, when, those cats are in, when those lions are in attack mode, they spread their legs out wide, and they just lunge at you and stop. It was coming after him. I thought, boy, that dude is dead. And he keeps screaming and throwing rocks at that thing. I thought, buddy, that cat wants you. He's got you. Samson ripped a lion like that apart with his bare hands, the Bible says. Just ripped it apart. The Bible says that he took those, uh, he caught those uh, foxes, what, 150 of them? And he burned down all that corn? 
The Bible says he killed uh, a thousand, was it a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of an ass? When people, tried to, when people tried to ambush him, the Bible says that he, he lifted up the gates of this city and he hauled them 35 miles away. That thing had to weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. He put it on his back and walked 35 miles with it during the night. His strength was absolutely amazing. All of these things the scripture says that he did and nobody knew how he did it. The value of godly power. Here's the principle for you and I as a Christian. It is not our wisdom or knowledge or ability that is going to impress or change the world. It's not our wisdom, knowledge, or ability to change the world. It is God's ability to take people who really aren't that much, to be honest with you, and do absolutely incredible things with them. Here's, here's a, a scripture that we should be familiar with often to just keep our check, uh, keep our pride in check. And it's 1 Corinthians, you, you know where it's at, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, when Paul says this in verse number 23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's why I think Samuel looked like a normal guy. God's going to do things so that he gets the glory for it. It's not our wisdom and our knowledge and our ability. It's, it's God. The value of godly power. It's not, it's not in you and I to be clever enough to argue this world into heaven. It's the power of God that's going to make a difference. So the value of godly parents, the value of godly peers, godly power, and fourth, the value of godly plans. Godly plans. In chapter 16, verse number, back in Judges, chapter 16, and verse number... 27. It's the end of Samson's life. It's an incredible scene. I don't know how big this house is. It, it refers to this structure as a house, but this has to be a huge house because what Samson is about to do is going to result in the deaths of more Philistines than everything he's done before, the Bible says. So it says in verse 27, now the house was full of men and women and all the lords of the Philistines were there and there were up on the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. Remember, he's been captured and he's chained between these two pillars. Verse 28, Samson called on the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the Lord's and upon all the people therein. So the death which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. The value of godly plans. I don't think, and I, you remember the, do you remember the series title of our biography with Samson? Anybody remember this? Wasted Potential. That was my series title for his biography, Wasted Potential. Samson's problems arose because he forsook God's plans for his life. All of the things that he encountered, these women... Uh, these, these uh, Philistine enemies, they all came about because he forsook God's plan for his life. How many times, note how many times Samson, who, by the way, was supposed to be set aside to serve God, 
How many times did he lie to Delilah? He just lied. Look how he provoked and, and, uh, and uh, teased and aroused the anger of the Philistine people. Look how he went to woman after woman after woman. Godless Philistines. This is, a, this is one who was supposed to be set aside as a Nazarite to serve the Lord his entire life. He forsook the plan of God. When he finally tells Delilah the truth, she betrays him. I pointed this out to you before. The Bible says that he loved Delilah. The Bible never says Delilah loves Samson. In fact, you remember what we made? I, I made that observation. Samson loved Delilah. Delilah loved money. And she betrayed him. And now he's at the place where he now he's at the place where he is. I don't know if she was afraid for her own safety being attached to Samson. I don't know. I, I think there's a probability that she heard about that woman that was burned by the Philistines, his first wife, that was burned by the Philistines, and now the lords of the Philistines are coming to Delilah and saying, hey, find out his secret of his strength and we'll give you money. But underneath that is, if you don't find out the secret of his strength, well, you heard what happened over there in Timnath, didn't you? I mean, those, those two cities weren't 30 miles apart. And so she betrays him here. But it's... The cause is that he forsook God's plan for his life. He set out to do his own thing. Well, what his mom and dad thought, Manoah and his wife, what they thought about God, that was just too, that was just too out there for him. That was just way too, way too conservative for Samson. He was going to have a good time in this world, and he determined to do that. And here's the truth. Like I said, I think we'll see Samson in heaven one day, but this is the truth. A Christian, a, a lot of problems that Christians experience are of their own making because they fail to follow God's plan for their life. The illustration is, uh, well, let's use Jesus' illustration. Do you remember Matthew chapter 7? He talked about two builders, and they built two houses, and one chose a right foundation, one chose a wrong foundation. And the next thing you know, one, the Bible says that when it fell, Great was the fall of it. That means it went down. Did you see that barn over here on Highway 11E in Talbot? That was a beautiful barn. They had just painted the side of that thing with something about University of Tennessee. and That thing blew up. And if you drove by there 10 minutes after that thing blew up, there was nothing left. Great was the fall of it. It's the same with building our lives. When we built this building back in, we started in 2006 and moved in in 2007, one of the things that they, they did here, after it pushed all the trees out of the way, some of you remember what this used to look like up here. It was a forest in here. They pushed down all these trees. But one of the things they did was they, they drilled these core samples all over this property from, from this side of our building, where the building is now, to over toward the fence line, which is our property line. The reason they did that was because we wanted to know where we need to put this piece of property. We changed a lot of the topography up here. Um, this, this used to look like a saddle up here. It was not the flat piece of property we have at all. It looked more like a saddle. And, and they moved a lot of dirt around here. And then they came in and they did all these core samples because they wanted to make sure that where we put the building was a safe place to put it. And the architect drew his plans and we followed those plans. Now we could have said to ourselves, well, you know, I don't think that thing over there needs to be 22 feet tall. Let's go ahead. Let's push that up a little bit. Let's make it 28 feet tall. Don't change anything else. Don't change the structure of the two by the, the two by's holding it up, the metal studs. But let's go ahead and add six or eight more feet to the height of that. And I don't particularly care for the gauge of metal roof that's on the building. It probably needs to be a little heavier because every once in a while we get hailstorms around here. So let's make it a little heavier. But we don't want to pay for the, uh, the steel that's holding the roof up. Make the roof heavier, but leave everything else alone. We didn't do that at all. You can feel safe sitting under the roof tonight. Why would we do that? Because there was a, there was a right plan to follow in constructing the building. May, may I say this to you? And I'm not taking any, anything away from the sovereignty or the plan of God. But may I say this to you? God's plan was not for Samson to end up with Delilah. 
That was a violation of God's law. And God can't contradict himself. God's plan was not for her to know his strength. Because God said, don't tell anybody. God's plan was not for Samson to be captured and have his eyes put out. Those were the result of his sin. God's plan for Samson was not suicide. So why did God allow it? God's sovereignty comes into that picture. But I know that God doesn't contradict himself. God's plan was not these things. It was Samson's choice that brought him to this place of bondage and suffering. Can you imagine seeing the man of God? It's one thing to suffer for righteousness sake, Jesus said. But let no man say I am tempted of God when he's drawn away of his own lust. Samson doesn't get to sit there in that Philistine house with his eyes gouged out and his physical strength failing and in chains being tied up and being mocked. He doesn't get to sit, sit there and say, well, this is just what God, you know, I'm just suffering for the Lord. No, let no man say when he is tempted of his, when he is tempted, God did this when he's drawn away of his own lust. That doesn't fly. His choice brought him to this place of bondage, bondage and suffering. And yet thousands of Philistines died with him. The enemy of God's people. Here's how I explain how that works out. You can write down, we're not going to turn there, but read Isaiah 61.3. Where the Bible talks about God's divine ability to give beauty for ashes. My choices made in my wisdom or in my strength, oftentimes result in a pile of ashes. I have burned that thing to the ground. It's an absolute mess when I operate in the power of the flesh. But somehow, because of his sovereignty, God can take my pile of ashes and he can give us beauty for it. Despite the fact that Samson rejected his plan, God still accomplished through Samson the destruction of over 3,000 Philistines. I don't know how he does it, but he does. The point I take away from Samson's story on this is make sure your plans are in harmony with God's plans. And, and look, don't justify what you want to do by, by saying, well, the Holy Spirit told me to do this or God told me to do that. Don't do that. I, I get tired of this. You ever get tired of that? Some of you have people come to you for counsel I, I get tired of people blaming God for them fulfilling their own fleshly desires. If you're going to do that, go ahead and do it. But don't blame God. Don't blame the Holy Spirit. Make sure that your plans, I need to make sure that my plans are in harmony with God's plans. So, four lessons tonight, right? Godly parents. Be godly parents who follow godly biblical principles. Your parenting is God's, it's his plan for training and protecting your children. So be godly parents. Godly peers. Remember Proverbs 13, 20. I wore that out as a youth pastor. I'm just telling you. Uh, our teens probably got tired of me hearing that verse, but, or saying that verse. I, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Godly power. Godly power. God uses his power to enable ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And the last one is godly plans. Someone said back, um, back a long time ago, I don't remember who said it, but they said success is finding and doing God's plan for your life. Success is not measured in dollars and and, and, and public testimony. Success is finding and doing God's plan for your life. I wish Samson had a better ending to his story, don't you? Can you imagine what a guy like that could have done had he been sold out to God? But too attracted to the world, too full of himself. And God, God delivered through him, but it was almost, does it not come across like God delivered Israel in spite of Samson sometimes? I don't want to do that. I, I don't want God to have to work with ashes in my life. I want God to find in me a heart that says, Lord, whatever it is you have for me, wherever it is you have, whatever you have, 
I, I so appreciate it. And those of you who didn't know him, it's your loss that you didn't know our former pastor, David Cross. But I'll, I'll forever remember how he went through a 13-year battle with pancreatic cancer. I'll, there, I, unless God takes my mind, I'll always have that as my standard. Because it just came down to this. This is the plan God has for me. When Samson came to that in his life, when it came to him to where he realized this is God's plan, Samson said, I don't want anything to do with that. I don't want anything to do with not drinking strong drink. I don't want anything to do with not touching a dead body. And ultimately, he came to the point where he said, I don't want anything to do with keeping my hair long because he told somebody that was the secret of his strength. When he came to God's plan, it was complete rejection. When you and I come to God's plan, let there be complete acceptance. You will never do more for you. This is the truth. You will never do more for you than God wants to do for you. You, you just won't. I'm going to be at the police department tomorrow morning at 645 for Bible study. We're going through the parables. We're coming to the parable tomorrow. Do you remember this parable? Where there's a guy who owns a vineyard and he comes early in the morning and he says, Hey, will you guys come work for me for a penny? He comes at like 6 in the morning. He goes back three hours later and says, Will you, you guys work for, for this? He goes back at 6, 9, 12, and I think the last one is at 5 o'clock. It's the 11th hour, so it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And the first, the first batch that he dealt with, they negotiated a price. They said, well, we'll work with you for a penny. We'll work today for a penny. And the vineyard said, well, okay, I'll do that. But the last guy, in fact, the guys from, uh, the guys from I think, the second and third shifts that he hired, they just... Listen carefully. They just trusted the word and the character of the vineyard owner who said, if you'll come work for me, I'll pay you. And they didn't negotiate a thing. And you got that last group that got hired at 5 o'clock, worked for one hour. They got the exact same pay that those guys that worked for 12. And the guys that worked for 12 come to him and said, how is it that they came? And they only worked an hour, and they got the same pay rate we did. And the owner said, wait a minute. That penny for the day was your idea. That was your negotiating for the play, day's plan. Here's, I, I don't think that parable has anything to do with salvation. I don't think it has to do anything with reward. I think it has everything to do with our attitude towards serving Christ. Amen. And had Samson come to God and not come to God on his own terms and said, I'll just do your plan, whatever it is, I think we'd have a completely different story in Judges 13 through 16. The best, the best counsel you and I can be receptive toward is to just cooperate with God's plan. Samson proves that for us. Because when we go our own way, it doesn't, my life doesn't look any different from Samson's if I'm going to live in the flesh like that. We can kick dirt on Samson's grave all we want to, but the truth is, without the Holy Spirit's leadership in our life, we're going to make those same fleshly, self-centered decisions. We'll do it too. So the key is just surrender to God's plan, be filled with his spirit, and watch what God can do. Second Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for those in whom he can show himself strong. That's who we ought to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Samson. A bad testimony to follow. We don't want to follow his example, but I'm glad you told us about him. And we pray that you would help us not, not to be so consumed, Lord, with what our life looks like to the outside world here. We get consumed with money or power or some type of prominence in society when all you're looking for is for someone to come to you fully surrendered and then let you do incredible things through them. Help that to be our heart. Surrender to you in everything. I pray in your name. Amen. God bless you, church. It's good to see you this evening.